1936, in the city of Amori, Japan, there was a man named Yoshi Shiratori who was imprisoned there. He was wrongly accused of a crime he didn't commit, and the prosecution was working to sentence him to death. They would beat and torture him every night. Fed up with the mistreatment, Shiratori decided to escape from Amori prison. In 1936, in the city of Amori, Japan, there was a man named Yoshi Shiratori who was imprisoned there. He was wrongly accused of a crime he didn't commit, and the prosecution was working to sentence him to death. They would beat and torture him every night. Fed up with the mistreatment, Shiratori decided to escape from Amori prison. At six o'clock in the morning, he began his move. He knew that there was a 15-minute window between the changing of the guards. He had studied their movements for months. As soon as the corridor was empty, he took a wire he had hidden and began trying to pick the lock of his handcuffs. His hands were numb from the cold, but after a few minutes of trying, he managed to unlock them. He knew he had only a few precious minutes before the guards returned, so he didn't waste any time. He opened door after door, navigating his way through the prison building. However, this was only halfway to freedom because even outside the prison building, he was still within the search perimeter, a large circle around the prison. If the alarm system was activated, they would be able to catch him by 6.15 in the morning. The guards returned and took a look at his cell. They saw Shiratori lying on his bed, unaware that he had escaped. They didn't realize that the piece of wood beneath the blanket was a makeshift dummy. He had cleverly placed it there to deceive them, and they didn't discover the truth until the next day. But let me tell you what happened to Shiratori just four days later. They caught him trying to steal equipment from a hospital. They brought him back to his cell, and because he attempted to escape again, they sentenced him to life imprisonment. This meant he would never see his wife and daughter again. All the months he spent planning his escape ended in just three days of freedom. After that, he received a life sentence, but he became known as the escape artist. The story goes much deeper than this. After six years, in 1942, during World War II, Shiratori was transferred to Akita prison in the city of Akita. The guards treated him even worse than in Amori prison. They had heard about his escape attempt there and wanted to teach him a lesson to deter anyone else from attempting the same. In addition to the usual beatings, they forced him to do heavy labor and made him sleep on the cold floor without a mattress. They kept him in solitary confinement for long periods. The problem was that their solitary confinement cells were specially designed, very small, with a high ceiling and thin copper plates covering the walls to make them extremely smooth, so you couldn't even lean against them for comfort. Sunlight didn't enter the room, not even during the day, as the only light source was a small window in the ceiling. They designed this room to hold skilled escape artists and ensure no one could escape. But what made it even worse was that the guards kept Shiratori's hands bound all the time, regardless of the constant harm he was enduring. One of the guards, named Kobayashi, who was the head guard, felt sorry for him. He never received a beating, and he would check his condition from time to time to make sure he was okay. Maybe that's what made Shiratori endure and have the determination to continue living in this situation until June 15th. It was a stormy night when Shiratori, as usual, was alone after midnight. One of the guards glanced at him and couldn't believe his eyes. Shiratori vanished into thin air. He wasn't in the cell. There were only the handcuffs. How did he manage to escape? The guards were confident in the measures taken to prevent Shiratori from escaping, including the handcuffs. But for Shiratori, the handcuffs were just a game, and he knew how to unlock them in every way. They said he unlocked them using a wire, just like he did in Amori prison. Surely he found a wire from anywhere when he was out of solitary confinement. He pressed the palms of his hands and his feet against the walls because they were close to each other, and he climbed up. They said his climbing skills were no less than those of a lizard. The first time he reached the window above, it was closed, and he couldn't open it but he noticed that the wooden frame surrounding it was rotten. So every night when he knew no one was observing him, he would unlock the handcuffs, climb the wall, push the frame aside, then come back down and put the handcuffs back on. After several months, he finally managed to open the window, but he didn't escape. He waited for a stormy night and a similar weather so that no one could hear his footsteps among the guards' voices and the sound of rain. That was his plan and he managed to escape from prison for the second time. Now watch what happened three months after his escape. 
On September 18th, the chief guard Kobayashi was at home when someone knocked on his door. When he opened it, he was shocked to see Shiratori, in a pitiful state, clearly in need of help. Kobayashi led him into his house, fed him, and let him rest. He listened to Shiratori's story. Shiratori told him, I didn't have a problem with being imprisoned or entering jail. I escaped twice to avoid the guards' torture. They showed me no mercy. I am an innocent and unjustly treated man. Your kindness encouraged me to come and tell you that I will go to the police and surrender myself to the Justice Department. But I want to file a case against the guards and expose the corruption within the Japanese prison system. I will launch a large campaign to bring about change to this situation of injustice. I want to regain my freedom, and everyone will know that I am innocent through the lawsuit I will file. This is the only way I can return to my wife and daughter. I don't want to continue living as a fugitive because that is not Shiratori's way. His plan is brilliant, escaping justice and then surrendering himself. But what's more important is that the head guard at Akita prison is the only one who treated him kindly and in a special way. Shiratori feels that he is doing the right thing. That is why he went to Koyabashi and told him about his plan. After a few minutes, Shiratori went to the bathroom and Koyabashi called the police. Koyabashi's trust in him was misplaced and his plan was unsuccessful. They sent him back to prison and he was shocked. After that, he stopped trusting any of the prison guards for his second escape attempt. During the trial, he was sentenced to an additional three years on top of his life sentence. He requested to be transferred to Tokyo prison because the weather there was warmer and he couldn't bear the cold in the northern prisons. His previous escape attempts had left him weak, but his transfer request was denied. Let's say the judge was very cruel to him, not only rejecting his request, but also transferring him to Abashiri prison in Hokkaido. This prison is located in the far north of Japan, and no one has ever been able to escape from it. If someone tries to escape, they will face a deadly winter hell outside the prison. This was in 1943, and the cold in Abashiri prison was unbearable. The temperature in the cell was below freezing, and when they gave the prisoners food, it would freeze before they could eat it. Despite the extreme cold, they put Shiratori in his cell wearing summer clothes. He was sitting there like a cripple, feeling hopeless. He tried to confront the guards, but they beat him and threw him to the ground. He stood up again, challenging them and telling them that he promised to escape from prison and no one could stop him. He told them that the handcuffs wouldn't be able to hold him because he knew a million ways to free himself from them. Even if he couldn't break the lock, he could simply break the chains in front of the guards. The guards were afraid and backed off. It was clear to everyone that he had skills other than climbing. The situation was astonishing, but at the same time, it wasn't smart of him, because when the guards saw his abilities, they became aware of his capabilities and started preparing a new cell for him, one that he could never escape from. They made it out of steel so that there was no chance of it being weak, and all the openings were smaller than his body, meaning he couldn't get out in any way. On top of that, they put handcuffs on him, with his hands behind his back, and they also tied his legs so he couldn't move. The problem was that the handcuffs were of a different kind, and there was no place to put a key in them, meaning they didn't have a lock. They weighed 20 kilograms, and the only way to remove them was for two specialists to come every week and unlock them. The process took them two hours, and they would only unlock them when he was allowed to take a shower, which they only allowed once a week. Despite the freezing cold and harsh winter conditions, his strength wouldn't last. To make sure the guards were even more certain, they reduced his food ration and only gave him half a meal. And indeed, the man's story came to an end and he had no energy to do anything, and they humiliated him a lot. Every time they brought him food, they would leave it at the door, and because the openings were small, he had to crawl like a dog to be able to eat the handcuffs that were on his hands and feet prevented him from moving. Even sleep was very painful for him. His life in Abashiri prison was a literal torture. Fortunately, winter passed, and spring came in the same state. Months went by, and nothing changed until one night, a guard who worked in the offices inside heard a noise from the ceiling. He went to check on the prisoners, and when he reached Shiratori's cell, he was shocked. The bed and clothes were neatly folded, and the specialized handcuffs were untied and placed next to the bed. Shiratori was nowhere to be found. Quickly, they activated the alarms, and despite their efforts to search for him, the man disappeared and vanished from the prison. But how did he manage to do it and escape from Abashiri prison under the circumstances he was living in? 
The preparation for this escape began six months ago, when he had no strength or energy. The only thing he had was time and patience. Every day the guards would give him food, and even though the portions were small, he would leave some of it. He would sit there, pretending to watch from the window, and he would spray the soup on the iron frame of the window and put some of it on the handcuffs. His plan was that the salt in the food would corrode and weaken the handcuffs and the iron frame, making them easier to remove. After a month, indeed, the iron became weak, and by the end of spring, he was able to unlock the handcuffs and the iron frame of the window. Even though the guards had calculated and made all the openings small, they didn't know that Shirothori was the type of person who had unnatural flexibility. You have surely seen videos of people like him on the internet, those who seem to have no joints. Shirothori only needed to stick his head out of the window, and after that, everything was easy. His bones were pliable, just as he wanted. And so, he became the first person to escape from Abashiri prison. A great effort, and a successful plan. But don't forget, this prison is in the far north, and as I told you, there is the hellish cold. The guards were already laughing and saying that he was crazy. If the cold didn't kill him, he would become a meal for a bear in the mountains. After the news spread that he had escaped once again, the only one who had hope and wished that Shirothori would stay alive was his wife. She was afraid and sad for him because she knew that even if he managed to survive in that cold, he wouldn't be able to come back to them because the police would surely continue to pursue him. She was torn between her love for him and her own well-being. She wished that Japan would lose the war, because if Japan lost, it meant that America would take over the country and the system would be destroyed. No one would be interested in or have time for her husband. After a year of this, in August 1945, her wish came true, and America indeed took over the country. The prison system has been changed, and some charges have been overlooked. The search for Sheratori is no longer important, but the question remains, where is he? Is he still alive? The answer is yes. He is alive and completely isolated from the world. This time, he imprisoned himself in an abandoned mine on the slopes of Mount Hokkaido. He believed he could manage his situation and live there. As for food, he would eat fruits and anything on the trees. He would also hunt wild rabbits and raccoons, so he was self-sufficient. Life was going smoothly, but over time, curiosity killed him. He spent two years hiding, not talking to anyone or seeing anyone. When he finally came out of the mountain and went to the nearest village, he discovered that everything had changed. All the streets were filled with English writings, and the signs and flags that symbolized war had disappeared. He didn't understand what had happened until he picked up a newspaper that was lying on the ground and flipped through the pages. He saw the news about the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and learned that Japan had surrendered a year ago. It was a big surprise for him, and he realized that all the time he wasted hiding was unnecessary. He immediately left his wildlife behind and headed south from Abashiri. He walked for 50 days until he reached a city called Sapporo. He was hungry and looking for something to eat when he found a tomato farm. He entered to eat from it, but it turned out to be a big mistake. The farmer saw him and thought he was a well-known thief, so a big problem arose between them. They fought, and unfortunately, it ended with a knife piercing the farmer's abdomen. The farmer died shortly after, and not much time passed before Sheratori was arrested. They recognized him as the famous Sheratori, who had escaped from prison. Now, he was a murderer, and despite his attempts to convince them that it was self-defense, the court sentenced him to death in 1947. He was sent to prison to await his punishment and prevent him from escaping. This time, they placed him under 24-hour surveillance with six armed guards. They updated his cell to make it stronger than the one in Abashiri. The door, ceiling, bars, and windows were all reinforced, and any opening was made smaller than the size of his head, because they knew about his abilities, that his bones were flexible, and he could control his joints. However, they were sure that he couldn't do anything to his skull since the openings were smaller than his head. The guards were confident this time, to the point that they didn't put handcuffs on him. Sheratori, now older, was nearing his execution date and wouldn't be able to do anything. What was more important was that everyone could see despair on his face. He would constantly look upwards, searching for an escape plan, although they knew that this would never happen. It was just a precaution to check on him in his room every night. But when they entered the room to punish him, and they uncovered him, he was gone. It was impossible. 
How did he do it this time? From the moment they imprisoned him, he was under 24-hour surveillance with the guards. He pretended to keep looking upwards, searching for an exit, and they knew that all his previous escape attempts involved climbing walls and exiting through windows. This made them suspicious. He deliberately looked up as if he was searching for a plan, but they didn't know that it was all an act, and that he knew exactly what he wanted to do from the beginning. They were very worried about his previous escape attempts, climbing walls and escaping through windows, so they neglected the floor. This made his escape this time much simpler and easier. All he did was remove the wooden planks from the floor and dig a hole underneath his bed. It took him over a month, and he was able to conceal his work because the guards didn't suspect this method at all, and because he would always return the wooden floorboards to their place every night after finishing digging the hole, they would see him sleeping, thinking he was just lying on the mattress. Now, he has escaped from prison four times. They would catch him, and he would escape again. It became ridiculous. In 1948, exhaustion took hold of him in his 40s, and the act of escape became a game for young people. One day, in a neighborhood, he sat on a chair on the street to rest, and a police officer came and sat next to him. The police officer, not knowing who he was, started talking to him. Shiratori knew that if the police officer found out who he was, it would be trouble. So, he tried to play it cool and have a normal conversation with the officer, not giving him any reason to suspect anything. Suddenly, the police officer made an unexpected move for someone like Shiratori. He took out a pack of cigarettes and offered him one. Shiratori was shocked. Cigarettes were very expensive and considered a luxury in Japan at that time. The idea that someone would offer him an expensive item like a cigarette, especially a police officer who had always been treated poorly by the police, made him remember his former boss, Kobayashi, and how he betrayed him and reported him when he had him at his house, and how this police officer treated him with respect and kindness, without even knowing who he was. He couldn't hold himself back, and told the officer his full name, Yoshi Shiratori, and how he couldn't believe that a police officer would offer him something valuable. He escaped from Saburo prison last year, and he has escaped from prison four times in his life. It was a strange feeling of relief, of course, he was apprehended, but this time was different. He surrendered willingly, and the Japanese law was going through a period of change. The higher authorities in Saburo empathized with him and considered his statement that the farmer's death was self-defense. They took into account that his escape attempts never harmed any of the guards, and that he only fled to escape their torture. Despite this, he did not seek revenge against them. At the end of the trial, the higher authorities overturned the murder conviction which meant the death penalty was revoked. Instead, they sentenced him to 20 years in prison. This time, they agreed to transfer him to Dafi prison in Tokyo. For the first time, the guards treated him kindly. It was a strange feeling. They were cautious and warned him not to escape, but he had stopped thinking about escaping. He never wanted to escape from prison itself, only from the treatment of the guards, the unjust death sentence, and the cold northern climate. None of these things existed here, so there was no need to escape. He accepted his punishment and served his sentence without any problems. After 14 years, in 1961, because he had regained his sanity, he was released. For the first time in a long time, he was free and not running from anything. He decided to return to his roots, to where everything began, and he reunited with his daughter, the only person left from his family. Because of his remarkable escapes, he became famous in Japan, like a hero. This was our story for today. I hope you enjoyed it.